Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. Today, I am joined by Duncan Palomortis because it is Philosophical Friday. Duncan, what's up, sir? How are you, sir? Happy Philosophical Friday. Thank you. Thank you. I'm doing doing quite well. Just chilling. Excited to be having this conversation with you. What's what's on the slate today? What are we talking about? Uh, so uh, we're following the trend of really nice suggestions from the villagers. Uh, today we have a, a, an excellent question by George. Uh, he, he goes by the nickname of Cream Puff. Uh, and uh, it's a question about intuition. So we're going to dive into the concept of intuition. Uh, we're going to try to understand what is intuition, how does it apply to poker, uh, how can it be cultivated, if at all, um, you know, how important um, it, it can be, and some benefits and downfalls. Um, right. Um, so I guess the first question is, what is intuition? And let me let me throw that one at you. Sure. What is intuition, Duncan? Well, the answer is nobody knows, right? So <laughs> that's it. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, no, but in, in all seriousness, it looks like intuition is some sort of like the amalgamation of evolutionary um, uh, years of basically the, the amalgamation of traits from years of evolution uh, of things that we don't necessarily un understand or they don't seem causal to us and yet we think to um, expect uh, specific outcomes. So um, basically it is a way, a response system, right? It's a form of a response system to specific triggers of our environment, but we don't necessarily understand the whole process of what is it that causes that trigger and why our response is the way it is. That's why it's called, uh, you know, intuition as opposed to, you know, decision making, right? Where we somebody um, tells us or the environment gives us something and then we sort of like we go through a, a mental process and then we decide we're going to go left or right. It's, it's kind of like in, it's, it's an instinct, instinctive um, response to something. Sometimes people call it the gut feeling. So... Again, it's a trigger response system where the in-between is a little bit foggy, is a little bit fuzzy. And, um, uh, and, and that's why I'm saying that nobody really uh, knows anything about it. Because uh, in essence, but people would argue that the reason why, for example, uh, let's say we will hear a weird sound, right? Let's say we hear a weird sound in your apartment and you don't know what that sound is. And what's, what's, what's your typical response to that? Um, fear? Fear, exactly. Exactly. Fear would be probably number one, right? I mean, and, and then, you know, people would say curiosity. It's not really curiosity, right? I mean, when you go like this and then you get into the, the fight or flight mode, that's not really curiosity. That's really fear. That's exactly correct. And the reason why, you know, fear exists is because we've been trained through years of evolution to when when we actually hear in our, hear or see uh, or taste or smell something in our environment that we're, it's not supposed to be there, we're starting to worry that something might be off. Some dangers may 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 lure, or you know, some some predators. Yeah, I think uh, Adam Creek, my Olympic gold medalist friend, said it uh, pretty pretty well when he said that the the body has intelligence that the mind never knows. Um, exactly, and it's the same sort of phenomenon of like you're in a coffee shop and you just feel someone staring at you, right? Like exactly. we can all that resonates with all of us. We feel someone and then, you know, we look and someone is right. Um, and, and I think like uh, another one that, that pops up in my life, uh, spookily regular is, um, just the, the thought of like, Oh, I need to call this person. Like, uh, it's right. been a while since I've spoken with this person. And then the phone rings, you know, right. 30 minutes later and that person is calling you and right, it's like, right. whoa, that is just, that's really Spook. weird. Right. Yeah. It, it happened with, um, my grandmother's sister who right. I hadn't spoken with in like a year. I thought about her while I was at the gym. She called me before I could leave the gym. Right. right, right. Um, again, like I think there is something to this sure. and as it relates to, to poker, um, intuition to me, I mean, I've always thought of it as the knowledge, the study, the work that I've done sort of manifesting through my central nervous system in a moment when a decision needs to be made, right? Like this is sort of like, it's a thing that can be calibrated, I believe, um, because once you're aware that your intuition is leading you one way or the other, um, basically because 
I am who I am. Uh, I try to reverse engineer why. Why did I get that feeling? What were the data points that you know I must have seen or had to have known in order for my gut to be like, yeah, I just don't believe this guy at this time. Without any like real meta game going, without right. any like having an observation, they've done anything gut feeling. out of line. Yeah, the gut just says, this is off. Something's weird here. I can't explain it, but I feel like I should bluff catch in a situation where I just sh- shouldn't. Uh, if I looked at this technically and rationally, probably shouldn't bluff catch, but just something feels weird. Um, that right. to me is like, you know, that's in my intuition manifesting basically. Absolutely. And and let me just say a couple of words about this. Like the evolutionary history that lies like really deeply in, into, our, uh, into our DNAs and we, uh, you know, we don't understand half of it and half of it is probably the overstatement of the year. We probably don't understand 99.9% of it, right? Uh, don't similarly, understand enough to even know what we don't understand. Basically. Exactly, exactly, exactly correct, yes. Um, but like the evolutionary history deeply hidden into our DNA, there is also history which are deeply hidden into our subconscious, right? Um, the idea, for example, that you know uh, you are faced with somebody and you think they're lying could be a combination of both of these things. For example, it could be because your ancestors, um, they were better at detecting um, lies, so that's why they reproduced and you, you came into existence, Thanks, thank God. <laughs> and uh, the uh, also at the same time, it could be your sample size of all the people you've you know uh, interfered with in the past, and you had the opportunity to see how many of these people were lying, how many of these people were not lying. Because as poker players, we get a lot of that, right? We get to see a lot of people lying, and we actually catch a lot of those liars uh, in the act. Even if you know somebody doesn't get caught bluffing at a specific moment, it's fair to say that. Most of us who play, you know, gazillion of ours at the poker table, we have seen a lot of people bluffing. So we know how a liar looks like. So if you take all of these thousands of hours, right, and you let them sink into whatever they sink into, whether whether you're going to call it subconscious, unconscious mind, whatever you're going to call it, then you have this database working in the back of your head and it can actually become what we now call the gut feeling. Yeah. You you know what's interesting about this, Duncan, is that at the poker table, I will live and die by that feeling, right? That intuitive feeling that someone's being deceptive. Mm-hmm. In the real world, every instinct of my gut can say, this person is being deceptive. There are red flags here. Mm-hmm. And yet I just can't act on them. I give the benefit of the doubt, mm-hmm. um, which, yeah, I don't know exactly what that says about me. Pr- probably that I'm really good at poker and life sometimes <laughs> uh, a, a fish. Um, but yeah, it, I do see that skill manifest and that I just ignore it a lot of the time. Let, let me, because actually I think that, that that's interesting. Let's dig a little bit deeper, right? So do you think this is actually a, uh, because at what level do you give them the benefit of a doubt? At the level of the action or at the level of um, meta action? In other words, you're thinking in the back of your head, what, what if I'm wrong? Because th- th- there's a difference there. Like, do you act as if that person is honest or do you act as if that person is dishonest? That's that's the question that, that I'm asking here. I act as if they're honest. Okay. Okay. Until so it's proven okay. that they're dishonest, and then okay. my gut okay. instinct has is validated. Okay. I see. I see. This is this is interesting because again, but 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 you probably like again. It, it depends on what's at stake, right? I mean, if if for example any of your family members are at stake and something like that, would sure, you act sure. as it? Yeah. So, right, right, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that can actually mean, because again, if we, if we don't think we're going to get hurt, I mean, we can give the person the benefit of a doubt because, you know, the world is better with honest people. And let's face it. I mean, probably the majority of, of people are at least decent, you know, we wouldn't call them necessarily perfect, but you know, like the majority of, I don't know, would you disagree with that? That the majority of the people around us are, you know, on the decent scale versus like the, the psychopathic kind of like cruel uh, pathological no, liars. They're, they're mostly all uh, pathological liars. And <laughs> what, a loaded, like, what a loaded question. Yeah. Like, you, you think know, I would be in a public question. space, the public space, if I thought everybody was a sociopath that would follow me on social media, exactly. I'd be, I'd be massacred, you know, yeah. in, a, in a month's time. Uh, Obviously, no, I'm joking with the question, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it was a leading well, question I, on purpose. Yeah. I think most people are yeah. generally decent. And I think that also yeah. even deceptive people where, you know, I, I feel that gut feeling, that red flag, I think that they deserve the benefit of the doubt 
and that they have an opportunity to not do sure. not be deceptive, right? They have an opportunity to do better. They have an opportunity to change and grow. And it's really, I, I think that belief in humanity's ability to change and grow and break out of these cyclical bad things um, that pushes me to uh, just take chances in situations where maybe I shouldn't. Exactly. Let me let me actually double down on this because that idea of taking chances, that idea of basically exposing yourself to positive black swans, I think it's actually an excellent risk reward approach. So it it goes again because like the um, you, you can you can see that the intuition can actually help us in that direction. Think about the potential potential risk and the potential reward in that situation, right? I mean, you're meeting with a new person, right? Uh, all, all, all alarms go off, but at the same time, you know, if they lie to you, you don't, you don't have anything super important at stake at that point. So your risk is actually, okay, I'm going to be ridiculed by that person because they fooled me once or whatever, but then nobody else will know. But on the flip side of things, that person may actually be having just a bad day and they may end up being like a very good business relationship a long term or they can end up being like a, a positive influence in your life right so the adding an extra person in your life has as unlimited potential as humanity itself right i mean that that person can be as beneficial or as detrimental as humans can be so the question is how much are you risking right yeah so not much to be yeah. to be frank right like right. i'm risking feeling disappointed i'm risking feeling right. Uh, you know, the self-flagellation of like, you idiot, why did you do this again? Like, right. why, why did you make this mistake, right? Like, that's sort of the risk. And, and I think like, ultimately, it's a disappointment that like, man, had a chance. And in some way too, I take responsibility for right. when things don't work out, even though like, I already have these red flags, right? It's still like- As we all should, by the way. I like should be able to reach this person. Why did I fail? Why did, was I not able to make mm -hmm. an impact in the way that I wanted, right? Like right. all of those sort of uh, anxious and angsty thoughts uh, and trying to figure out how to do better next time. Right. Um, yeah, that's sort of the, that's the downside risk for from my perspective. Right, which again, depending on the situation may be, larger for some people or, or, or smaller for, for some people. But to me, that doesn't sound like a, a very a very big, big big risk necessarily. For me, it wouldn't sound like a very big risk. Some potential big risks are, you know, like harm to yourself or to your family, a big sure. waste of time. This can also be problematic, you know, like you are involved with some people in your life that, you know, um, that or can, some sort of catastrophic failure through this right. this one relationship in business or personal life or you know whatever it is like the, again like these things can be way worse right like you mentioned like uh, sociopaths or whatever right. like sociopaths for some reason you, you become a target well right. that's a pretty dangerous spot to be in for Correct. both your business your career um, just all sorts of things could go wrong absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and comparing that to poker, because I think, again, like I said, I mean, this is actually very deep. So most of our interactions in everyday life, they don't have a high cost associated with them. Like if we if we be lied to by somebody, big woof, who cares, right? But at the poker table, let's not think about the risk and the reward, right? Like we could potentially be making a gigantic mistake if we go against those instincts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because again, now the stakes are pretty equal on the risk and the reward for the most part, right? I mean, we don't want right. to oversimplify, but there's not that fundamental asymmetry that we can find in life with very small risk and unlimited potential, there's no such thing as poker. There's no such thing as unlimited potential in poker, right? So it's very specific and very fixed. So it is interesting what our instincts sometimes are telling us, right? I mean, they can tell, like our instincts could actually reveal, this is, by the way, something I haven't thought before, just like conversing with you, you're smiling, mm -hmm. I like that, you know, that that asymmetry, like our instincts could potentially reveal that uh, they love that. Like our instincts love that potential asymmetry, you know, like where, where the outcome can be unlimited, but the, the, the risk limited, which is not something that happens in, in, in poker. Yeah, asymmetrical risks. I mean, they're, we should be taking as many of them as possible in life, right? And being okay with, with the downside. It's sort of like, a, um, and I think a lot of it is just um, vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. It's like when you struggle with vulnerability or when you, lay yourself bare and you are vulnerable, then that you don't want to deal with the emotional rejection or any sort of like sense of betrayal or anything like that. Um, 
but yeah, I, I do think it is an asymmetrical risk. And I think that like, there are always lessons and takeaways and things you can learn through each experience and try hopefully to do better because yeah, I mean, for the people that enter my inner circle in the poker space, um, I want to do anything that I can do for them. Like I, I want to make a positive impact. This is mm -hmm. my number one value right. in a professional sense is impact. And so like when I don't, or when things fall apart, yeah, that's, uh, quite sad for me, but I see what you're saying. And, um, yeah, maybe my, my intuition is calibrated. Okay. To see that, see the risks of, uh, the downside here, like is sort of emotional in nature and not so much. The upside's quite large. Um, we're at the poker table. You're absolutely right. It's, there's a risk in return. And when you don't trust your intuition in a spot and you get killed, um, there's a very re real and immediate punishment for the downside. A, a comparable to the reward. Compare, right? Comparable to the reward. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and to, and, and to be fair, I mean, the opposite, uh, asymmetrical disasters uh, are out there, right? I mean, like uh, sure. an, an example would be playing with guns, right? I mean, there's very limited upside and then- Road uh, rage. Right? Exactly, road rage, exactly. All of these things. So it's like, there are all sorts of, so it's not like, and again, when you're talking about vulnerability and, and we've talked about a lot in, this, in these podcasts, right? I mean, the idea uh, of anti-fragility, uh, also known as the Kelly Clarkson principle, of course, uh, is the, 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 the thing that sometimes- we want to expose ourselves to a little bit of variance, a little bit of volatility to strengthen ourselves, but not too much, right? So there is a, a limit to that. So when we talk about vulnerability, there's different degrees of vulnerability, right? I mean, we, yeah. we, we want to, uh, you know, train you ourselves. Wanna <laughs> you want to bench press 200, but you don't want to try to bench press 800 pounds, right? Like, exactly right. <laughs> exactly too right. Much. It's too much, exactly. And what is too much varies from person to person. And sure. So speaking of, you know, like, variability and uh, varies from, from person to person, you know, how does in, in, in intuition apply to poker? Why don't you give us some like uh, examples, basic and maybe not so basic examples of situations where intuition has helped you at the poker table? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've, uh, told stories about like one specific spot happened at the WSOP a, a while ago where, um, and, and this was, Oh, actually, uh, I, another story that I told um, with John, I believe he was interviewing me on Tactical Tuesday. But mm -hmm. basically, the situation was such that I was playing against another player at Commerce, and we played a really big pod. I rivered one pair on the river. Um, they called the flop, raised a turn, and I called with like an open ender, straight draw to flush draw. And I rivered like fifth pair right. or something, and I checked, and they jammed for like 2,500. Um, is that the queen five hand? Was it the queen five hand? No, no, that okay. was a that that was a different one. But okay, good. Okay, this one was like four or five of diamonds or something. Okay, like that. okay. And, and anyway, I, I rivered a four. Mm -hmm. It was like a nine high board. Turn was an ace. I mm -hmm. bet the turn. They raised, and I called, and the river. I rivered like a four and mm -hmm. jammed, and I ended up calling right just mm -hmm. because my intuition thought that something was up. Like my mm -hmm. intuition was like, hmm, like basically they're repping sets plus. I had a or sense, nothing. I actually had a sense on the turn before I bet that they were going to raise mm. because it was an ace. And that was a situation that I'd studied quite a lot um, online, uh, basically raising on aces when villains bet, because like this was probably 2014 mm -hmm. and uh, conventional wisdom of the preflop raiser is like, oh, when you're bluffing and like uh, the turn is an ace or the turn is an over card, it's a good card for your range. So keep bluffing. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, this was like, everyone's talking about this. And like, I see it on TV, like, oh, ace on the turn. It's like candy for the pros, you know? Right. Like that. Um, so then I just sort of thought about the next level and like, oh, well, if they're always betting on an ace and betting on an over card, they're over bluffing. Right. Therefore, when they bet on these cards, like I'm just going to raise like almost on an absolute basis. Right. Um, and so that was a situation I found myself in where I had combo draw turn, turn was an ace and I bet, and I just got this sense, like this guy is a very high level player, maybe one of the most naturally gifted players that I've played against in live poker. Mm -hmm. and I just thought like, ah, he knows, like, he, like he, he recognizes this spot. Um, and is going to be willing to take risks that maybe other players won't, right? And yeah, so I felt like he was going to raise. He did. I called. I rivered a pair. And then I just check called all in. Um, 
so I guess that's one situation where intuition, uh, yeah, bailed me out. I trusted my intuition. Um, I'm sure I have many other stories too. Yeah. Like the, the, the classic example, I have, I, I believe, uh, I've, uh, I folded like, uh, Kings before the flop three times in my entire career. I, I don't make a habit. And again, as you play higher, you, you do the spots, the spots happen less and less, but, uh, you know, I, I was I was correct all three times. Uh, yeah, and, me too. Yeah, I, yeah, right. Yeah, a, a, a tournament spot. Like I had tournament, black right. black kings. Right. This is two thousand five yeah. at Tunica. Um, guy limps, guy raises. I three bet black kings, and the limper limp four bets. Right, and the, the classic. The, <laughs> yeah, that was one of mine too. Yeah, in three the better folded, yeah. and I just like looked at my kings. I mean, it was almost instant. It was just like yeah. Boom. And of course, being 21 years old, I folded on face up and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the guy was, the guy was uh, cool enough to show me that he did in fact have aces, um, yeah. Yeah. which I busted out of that tournament, maybe 30 minutes later, by the way. And hmm. uh, <laughs> it did make the, the funny part about that was like, oh, I, I'm still in here. I still have to battle, uh, even though yeah. like I lost 35% of my chips just now, um, but I feel like I'm playing on house money. Yeah. Now that, that that actually reminds me, since we you know we're sharing stories and about intuition, uh, last year the WSOP, I was down to six blinds uh, and near the bubble, and uh, a guy shoves all in from under the gun. Everybody else folds, and I'm looking. That I have six blinds, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. I have six blinds. I, I can't. Did I say I have six blinds left? <laughs> yeah, six blinds. <laughs> six blinds. <laughs> so everybody else folds. I mean, the big blind, small blind folds, and the dealer is ready to uh, push the pot to the person to my left. I haven't acted yet, right? I mean, under a gun raised, right? Uh, and, and, and under the gun, actually, uh, yeah, uh, raised. So I'm sitting there, and then the guy goes, no, 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 the big blind hasn't acted yet. And I'm like, it's my life, dude. Like, <laughs> seriously? Are you serious? And I'm like, but, but I mean, at, at that point, you know, he shows me like, Aces or whatever, I'm still calling. I mean, we know with six blinds. So I, 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 you know, I, I shipped. Sure enough, you know, he snaps. He has, he has kings, of course, uh, and um, to no one's surprise, right? But you know, it is what it is. Sometimes you just have to have to go with it, you know. Like, uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure that, like, that this is another part of intuition, right? Yeah. That I'm sure that I felt that I should do something and it has worked out disastrously as well. Like right. I'm sure this has happened multiple times in my career. So it's not like a foolproof type of feeling, um, which to me is an indicator that it's something that can be calibrated and it really is based on off the table study, off the table thought, knowledge of what's going on in the same way that, you know, um, when, somebody's playing tennis professionally, they don't think about where the ball is going right. to go. They don't think about where they're going to go. They just react, right? right. And that intuition that they're being pulled around the court um, with is something they've trained for, right? right. It's muscle memory. Um, exactly. But like we said last week, right? The time to learn and <laughs> is not when you're playing professional tennis at a high level at Wimbledon. You're not, you're not there to like build up the muscle memory or build up the intuition, right? That's the shit that you do, um, training and in practice and, and on the daily grind. That, that is, that is exactly correct. And actually that brings us very nicely to the next question, which is how can intuition be cultivated? Like how, what can we do to actually, uh, improve our intuition? This is a loaded question and mm -hmm. one that, but not a leading one. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's loaded in that, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Nick Howard. He's been on the podcast mm -hmm. many times. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of everything that he does. And a lot of his mindset work these days in the poker field is based on trauma. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that there's multiple levels to this sort of cultivating intuition and that some intuition um, can be based on some traumatic event that you experienced that is just guiding you in one direction. It's like, uh, interwoven into your central nervous system mm -hmm. and it manifests at inopportune times. And until you resolve that, you can't really cultivate your ability to intuit well, when you're in the arena playing poker, you have to deal with that for that trauma first. So, yeah, I think like it's hard to um, cultivate intuition. Um, 
and yeah, but the way to do it from a poker sense is like the training, you know, the learning, the growing, the training, having conversations. Um, and then when you're in the game, uh, just having the confidence to execute and trust your training. But yeah. If I were to take the easy way out on the question like this, I would say, don't worry guys about the intuition because your intuition builds itself, right? I mean, you're going to actually build sure. the intuition no matter what you do, but that's the easy way out. There is actually the, the hard way out and, and it very much ties uh, with the concept you just talked about. I mean, you talked about dealing with the trauma, but I'm going to generalize this and I'm going to say, deal with whatever situation poker throws at you instead of actually pushing it away and try to forget about it. Dealing with it, thinking about it, processing it, whether it's trauma or something minuscule, or I guess we can say that any bad outcome is a micro form of trauma in some sense, if we want to completely generalize things. But uh, dealing with those issues, playing them again in your mind in a productive, of course, way, not just saying, oh, I just lost, I just lost, I just lost, but just say, why did I lose? Why did that happen there? Did I miss something obvious there? Was the opponent huffing and puffing the whole time? Where, was there something specific cue, a specific trigger that could have helped me? And some of that also happens unconsciously, but trying to play the moment again back in your head, try to pay attention, try to be cognizant of it. This is actually be, could be building your, um, uh, movement bank for the future, like your playbook bank. So now you have more um, uh, sample points that you can use for the future. So basically process those sample points and keep them in your mind, like make them make a memory uh, uh, stick by keep playing it again and again in your head. I know that may, may be counterintuitive to some who are thinking, well, Duncan, aren't we supposed to be, you know, mindful and Zen and let things be and forget things and be cool about it and all that stuff. And I, and I agree to that too. What I'm saying is not contradicting this. All I'm saying is that until a specific uh, environment trigger, ha uh, until it has been properly processed, it cannot be uh, discarded. That's the whole point, right? I mean, you have to process it first. We have to process it first. And then when we're done with it, we learn everything that was to learn. Now we can move it past and, and leave it behind us. Does that make sense what I'm saying? No, it does. It, it does make sense. I believe it It um, flows well with the work of Byron Katie. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a practice of um, investigating these high emotional moments and making sense okay. of them and understanding the story that we tell ourselves and what that story means um, dealing with that and then, you know, reframing it, right? Like sure. basically reframing it, um, but dredging it up from the subconscious, dredging it up from the past, uh, so that it doesn't, uh, have a negative impact, um, on us in the future. The right. classic example in poker uh, of this, by the way, is, you know, um, if you're listening to the audience, you're probably very familiar with this thought. I knew what to do why did I do something else, right? right? I knew the right decision to make. Why do I find like I'm having an out-of-body experience right. and choosing a different action in the moment, right. right? Well, it probably has something to do with some sort of trauma, like behind yeah. the scenes and this ability to trust yourself and your intuition in these spots where, you know, as you said, the reward and the risk are, you know, there, there's a direct relationship between um, the downside risk of not trusting your intuition at the poker table. Whereas in real life, the consequences are not as extreme. Um, mm. So yeah, I think that that probably plays more of a role than any sort of technical understanding of what to do in the moment, this ability to trust oneself mm -hmm. um, and be at peace with trusting oneself, uh, you know, come no matter what the results may be. Absolutely. And that actually reminds me that the concept of uh, being able to know when intuition is applicable, right? I have like a, a very, a very funny example that uh, my wife uh, was telling me that story. She was playing, uh, she was playing poker. And um, for those of you who don't know, by the way, my wife uh, started playing poker fairly recently, about two or three years ago. Uh, I'm going to brag here for a, for a minute. For a minute, she, she actually read the book and uh, she <laughs> she really liked it. She ended up being a, a winning poker player. And end of brag. So she um, so she was playing at the poker table, and then she was getting compliments. Like she's like, how 
she basically a guy was telling to her like how do you know what i always have it's like your reading skills are, are amazing and of course i mean my wife she's like you know soft spoken she didn't say anything she just smiled and then she was thinking in, in, in the back of her head and she shared that with me later well i mean you bet when you have it you don't bet when you don't so i just, <laughs> I just read the sizing you know yeah. and yeah. and this is you know very very common with poker players right i mean so intuition has a time and place more often than not, the bet sizing and the, the bet structure and the betting patterns tell you all there is to know. Like nine times out of 10, if you're paying attention, intuition is not necessary, I, I would argue. But there are situations where, you know, maybe it's not nine out of 10 situations. It, it, is, it is what it is, five out of 10 all the way up to, you know, nine and a half out of 10, whatever it may be. But there are situations where it might be more of a tiebreaker situation. And there, that could be a moment where you can listen to, to your intuition. And actually, to make matters even easier, if the decision is close, probably your action doesn't even matter too much to begin with. But why not, if you have a good intu intuition, why not make the right decision and get a few extra extra points uh, yeah. if you can? I, so let me just uh, go a little further mm -hmm. in that... There are observable data points in every single hand that you play that you can evaluate and try to reach a decision, right? Consciously. Uh, intuition is, in my mind, the evaluation of subconscious data points, right? It's like timing, posture, nonverbal communication, um, just these sort of data points that are outside of what is observable, aka the size of their bet on the flop, the pre flop formation. Um, the action that they took pre-flop, like the, the board itself, the turn card, the river card, their line in totality, uh, whether it's, you know, bet, check, bet, or check, bet, bet, or bet, 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 or check, check, bet, um, just whatever it is, these are like observable. And then there's things like timing, right? There's things like, uh, you know, sizing is another observable data point. I think nonverbal communication may be the biggest one as it relates to, um, live poker. And then, timing online is actually a pretty relevant data point mm -hmm. um, that in my mind hasn't been explored uh, to the extent of other data points. Um, and yeah, so to me, it's the evaluation of these data points that you can't quite put your finger on, you can't quite touch, and you don't have conscious information that's giving you feedback, but you're processing it subconsciously and then your central right. nervous system pings you and you know that's where you you have a response right but most things as you said are you can consciously break them down systematically in your thought process at the poker table and you don't need that feeling and as a matter of fact a lot of those feelings by the way are tough to discern right it's tough to discern between uh your intuition pinging you and anxiety or risk right. aversion or whatever it is, sunk cost fallacy. You know, there's a lot of different uh, cognitive biases that we can uh, get trapped by and kind of fool ourselves that we're following our intuition when it's really not. It's just our central nervous system. So I do think it is quite important to have a plan for these conscious lines, these conscious actions that we're making, a plan to evaluate them so that you can, you know, Basically, if that happens, if my gut says don't bet in a spot where I know I should bet, I just bet because mm -hmm. I don't think that's my intuition. I think that's risk aversion. I think mm -hmm. that's something else that I'm not exactly going to trust. Um, sure. So basically, the conscious data points will always outweigh the, uh, the subconscious data points um, unless the situation is very close and those subconscious data points, um, I feel like I should just value those. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually, now that you mentioned also the uh, biases and also the uh, idea of overriding uh, specific instincts uh, uh, or pseudo instincts, we can tell them like it's not they're not necessarily instincts, they might be um, I don't know how to call them, to be honest, uh, there are specific uh, pools in certain directions that we're overriding, right? I mean, they might not necessarily be instinct, but they could be instinctual pulls. But anyway, um, th this actually ties really nicely to the work of uh, Kahneman and Amos, uh, who actually, Daniel Kahneman actually wrote in the um, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a very popular book, like many, many people uh, like to talk about. It. And he talks about that idea very much. The idea, 
Um, first of all, he talks about his two different systems. He calls them system one and system two. Essentially, we have on the one hand, the instinctual thinking, and on the other hand, we have the slow and methodical thinking, right? I mean, the one that you, the instinctual thinking would be, you know, um, how you're going to uh, press the um you're driving and then you're going to hit the brakes immediately without thinking about it. And the other one is, you know, the type of process that is going to go when you do like funny multiplications or like difficult long divisions and things like that, difficult calculations. And then essentially what he says is that as people train themselves, uh, they actually move processes from the slow system to the fast system. For example, a chess master may instinctively find a very good move in, in, in a split second even though technically somebody who doesn't know much about chess, they would take a long more time to process it. So somebody who's essentially making instinctive decisions uh, on something very complicated is someone who's moving a lot of the work of system two to system one, essentially, if that makes sense, right? I mean, it's it's essentially, yeah. there's a lot of uh, spillover from, from, from one to another. And to what you said there, there there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of that going on, right? I mean, the idea that, um, knowing which systems to override and knowing which systems to trust. Uh, although it's not very clear whether we're talking about system two or system one, like whether we're doing that slowly and methodically or we're doing it very quickly, but it, it is very conceivable that a lot of that can happen very quickly, knowing which system to trust and which system to uh, uh, over, uh, override uh, just by uh, having a lot of data points and having a lot of experience at the poker table, which is what I mentioned earlier. No matter what you do, if you play at the poker table, intuition is going to build itself. No matter what you do, that's the easy way out. Yeah, I mean, how else do you play eight tables at the same time, right? Exactly. With difficult decisions simultaneously at four tables, right? You, exactly. Yeah, you you go to system one that that's trained and equipped and ready to rock and roll. Exactly, it becomes like in, instinctual, and then. That brings us nicely to one of the, um, you know, last couple of questions we have. First of all, what are some uh, benefits and, and and downfalls of, of intuition? I mean, we talked about eight tabling, and that reminded me, you know, like if we don't do it right, some, you know, that's the downfall, right? right? The downfall is that, you know, the downside of intuition is that if we look at like trauma, for instance. Um, you doesn't matter how hard you train. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you learn or what you think you know. If the trauma manifests in an environment that where you feel anxious and it causes you to not be able to execute when you need to, well, you have no hope in poker. You have no chance because you mm -hmm. can never make the right decisions that you need to make because your central nervous system just isn't letting you. So I think the, the downside is that. I think the downside of intuition is also that, um, like I, I said, that e even now when I play poker, right? my gut can be like, okay, this is like a, a bluff catching situation and villain will jam. And I know that it's a bluff catching spot, but I still feel this surge of anxiety uh, before I click call. And right. then like, regardless of whether I win or lose, right? I'll, I'll, most of the time I win, um, but the feeling is still there, right? I right. can't, I can't ignore or say that I didn't feel that. Um, but obviously it wasn't like my intuition leading me to the right decision. It was just some sort of fear manifesting in my central nervous system. So I think that like whenever you conflate intuition with your central nervous system, whenever you have trauma that's uh, not dealt with at poker, I think that like your intuition can be the biggest uh, downside to successfully navigating the world of poker. You're just not able to um, move past it. So I think that's like, the major downfall of intuition. Yeah, and again, goes back to, you know, we don't understand what intuition is, right? So it's very easy to conflate it with other things and be, yeah. it, it's, it's a very confusing process. Absolutely. Uh, one more thing I would add to that list uh, is that intuition itself, I would say, um, may not necessarily be the best game in town. So in other words, as great as the intuition can be for vague spots or situations where um, we don't have enough evidence, there's typically going to be better methods. Like you mentioned essentially in, in, in what you just said in the, in the previous answer, but also um, in your entire thinking thread today, right? I mean, the idea that all of these thought processes that go through your head, I mean, the fact that, for example, you know that um, a certain villain is um, bluffing in an above average frequency on the river, or it's a good opportunity to bluff catch, 
None of that is intuition, right? All of that sure. is 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 a lot of work that has been done at the poker table. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that if there is a better alternative to intuition, using intuition could be a mistake, right? Basically, going back to, to the example of, of, of my wife, right? If the betting says, you know, the, the, the villain has the hand, it has a good hand. It doesn't matter if, you know, they did something nonverbal or something else, because the, the thing that is the most um, trustworthy, which is namely the betting patterns, is there. So trusting the uh, the thing that works a big, 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 better percentage of the time might be the, the, the better approach there. So, yeah. And, and I mean, a lot of these things are very difficult to sure. navigate, right? It's like, Especially when, you know, like to me, data-driven poker strategies are the best ones, right? Because we're looking, uh, you, you just analyze like, if I know how you think, Duncan, well, I'm going to have really good strategies to play against you because I have a built-in edge. I know how right. you're thinking about the game. I know the actions you're going to take. We've never played poker against each other for one hand in our entire lives. And I recognize you're going to be quite aggressive, right? Before yeah. we even sit down, right. I believe that you're going to check raise often. You're going to be quite aggressive. Um, so then it's more of a function of figuring out the spots where you're being aggressive, why you're being aggressive, and then constructing a strategy around that. So like right. basically information is power in this game. Um, it allows us to use better strategies. So um, from that sense, like, you can have five good bluffing opportunities in a row. And because poker is what it is, you can get bluff caught five times in a row and you can lose. And then now if your central nervous system every single time was saying, don't bluff, they're going to call, don't bluff, they're going to call. And you do it five times in a row and it get, they all get called. Now we can say, oh, this data-driven strategy is not working. It's not profitable, right? Because we just tried it five times. But flip a coin five times in a row or flip a coin, you know, however many times you're going to get runs of like five tails in a row, right? It's a thing that happens way more regularly than human beings would think. Um, and if it's like bluff catching, for instance, right, where you have pot odds and you're supposed to win like a third of the time, well, yeah, you're going to bluff catch sometimes 10 times in a row and you're going to lose every single one of those. And it may get to the point to where you feel as if you shouldn't, but the reality is you should, right? Absolutely. Um, so, this is like, this is just a big challenge that humans have to deal with playing poker. Um, Absolutely. And, it's, and we want to trust our gut, right? We want to trust that feeling. But in a lot of cases, that feeling is just not trustworthy. Right. right. Let, let me actually repeat that because it's such an important point that I think is worth repeating. So what Brad is saying is that your intuition is working and is working well and correctly. But unfortunately, the example that he's talking about, it's working against you. Why? Because the variance so happens to be on the wrong side of things. So what, what, what the intuition is telling us is telling us, basically the intuition is following the variance as it happens. So if the variance happens to be on the one side, the intuition would only see the variance on the one side correctly. So sometimes the intuition, even if it's perfectly calibrated, it works against us because the intuition yeah. doesn't understand variance. And this is a wolf, a wolf thing that people who go through the programs, this, this is... A commonality that I've seen again and again. It's in the beginning, um, they believe that they join the program, a switch flips, they start deploying the strategies, and everything goes perfectly. And they're just, you know, making money every single day and winning every single session, right? Which is obviously a thing that can't happen when you play poker. You lose often, things don't go well very often. It's the nature of the game and the nature of variance. So what happens is guys will fundamentally take a step back generally when things don't work out and they're doing things that make their central central nervous system feel uncomfortable and feel uneasy. Um, and then it doesn't work. They struggle. They almost break. They, they kind of do break almost always. And then what happens is things start going right. Mm -hmm. Like they get a run of positive variance. Mm -hmm. And when that they get that run of positive variance and they see like, Oh, now I've done this a hundred times and I can uh, see that it's making money. Um, I won six sessions in a row, right? My win rate is to a point to where like it hasn't ever been before over, you know, 30,000 hands or 50,000 hands. That's when they buy in. Um, that's when, you know, they upgrade their intuition to the point of, yeah, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. 
the results are going to be whatever the results are. And it's coming to term terms with that feeling. And also, I mean, maybe it's just building calluses too, right? It's like mm-hmm. you just have right. to build calluses and recognize that like there is no strategy that's going to work 100% of the time. Unless, of course, I'm selling like super user software or something like that. That I, I guess you could build a strategy with that that always works, right? Mm-hmm. But we only can make decisions that work um, as often as possible. And then right. after that, we let the chips kind of fall where they may. Where they may, exactly. And um, one potential ramification of this, uh, one of uh, not only ramification, but also a remedy of this would be to um, point our intuition in the right places. What do I mean by that? This is actually extremely easier said than done. It's very difficult. But one poor use of intuition would be to try to get a feel for variance, right? A lot of people do that. Are they going to try, mm, how frequently should I get ACEs? It feels that I'm getting about the right amount. I think that's a wrong uh, deployment of, of, of intuition. Intuition is not great to actually get a feel for variance. Intuition is not about feeling variance. One good um, use of intuition would be to try and understand, for example, whether, to put it simply, whether the villain has it or doesn't this time, right? I mean, if you're in a close spot and then you ask, you want to ask yourself, well, I could go either way. Um, do I feel they're strong or do I feel they're weak? Basically, the example that uh, uh, Brad mentioned earlier, right? He felt that the opponent was full of it. He was taking advantage of an ace. It was a combination of good work away from the table and intuition. But this is also proper deployment of, of intuition. We're putting the intuition, we're waking it up in a situation where intuition can be good for because intuition cannot be good at telling us what is the streak of coin flips am i going to get heads this time i'm going to get tails intuition is not good at predicting variance or anything of the sort yeah but and- but by for binary situations for binary situations where is it a yes or a no do they have it or do they not that's where it excels in. and if you're sitting here listening to the podcast and you're like here here's a visceral example right when you are in a tournament for your tournament life and you're all in and you have ace king versus tens, what does your intuition tell you is going to happen? That you're going to lose, right? Your intuition Doesn't says matter. we're at risk, we're going to lose. This right. is it, right? At least that's my intuition when right. I get in with a flip in a tournament. I'm like, right. well, that's it. I'm going to lose, right? right? You get it in um, as a dog, right? Like ace five suited versus queens and you've got 35% equity or whatever. And you're like, right. well, it's over for me. I'm going to lose, right? When the reality is like, of course you've won flips. Of course you've got it in bad and you've won, right? right. It's just that, you know, human beings trend towards the negative because of the negativity bias. And so um, in those situations, we expect the worst, but that doesn't mean that the worst necessarily happens it just means that we expect it right and so that's that's the point to where we ha- kind of have to transcend and move beyond where we're at is recognizing that like yeah we can feel like we're going to lose this flip but that's not real right that's not the reality we still have to uh roll the cards out we still have to go through this and there's plenty of times you felt that way and actually won the hand so and, and, and again, uh, essentially, uh, underlying to to, uh, to your thought process is the idea of risk reward yet again. So the body is telling us the risk of us losing the tournament far outweighs the benefit. This is essentially the independent chip model far outweighs the benefit of doubling up. So getting out of the tour- so our bodies correctly again the intuition is doing the right thing is protecting us from danger. Right. So again, we have a small asymmetry. It's not as big of an asymmetry uh, as the other one we described earlier. We have a small asymmetry on the negative side, where, according to the independent chip model, that basically tells us if we actually, let's say that we have equal uh, stack sizes. If we lose, we're out of the tournament. If we win, we double uh, double up. Obviously, the extra chips we get are worth less than the chips that we already have. So there's higher risk on the downside. So correctly, the intuition is trying to protect us from that because that's what the intuitions are built for. They're trying to tell us, hey, avoid danger, avoid the tiger. Although not quite that, <laughs> that size, but it is what it, you know, you know, what is leading us. Yeah, there. no, I think yeah. it's it's great. I think this is like a great point to pull the plug on, on today's show. Do you, do you have anything else that you'd like to add or any questions? Just, just a fun question, which we can do it as like a, a you know, uh, uh, quick answer, yes or no question. Can someone be profitable poker player on intuition alone? What do you think? Yes or no? Like, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I, I don't think that question can get a yes or no 
answer as that quick for let's me. ask the audience then what do yeah. you guys think can someone be a profitable poker player on intuition alone i would like, say yes personally but okay I, i think that's maybe controversial and you might disagree but yeah. I, i would say yes it's an interesting one i mean honestly i don't know the answer to that like i mean it's very difficult for me to to think this is this is possible given how dominant the uh um the the strategies of the game have been and i don't necessarily talk about gto but about the fact that you know how telling betting patterns can be they're so telling it would be like handicapping uh to a, to an extreme degree and and also my concern would be like somebody without fundamentals would they just call all the time well, because they don't know they don't know they're supposed to raise like that's another issue so that i have to yeah. me it's like And I get it, it, it all hinges on how you define intuition. Sure. Right? And like what, and obviously we've, you know, come to the conclusion that you can't define it, which <laughs> is, is very lovely <laughs> uh, in having this, uh, this chat, but it, it's the theme, right? We can't define anything here. Yeah, so. well, We can't define Remember. anything. Um, but to me, it's chunking information and, and like, basically, even if, you aren't consciously thinking about betting patterns. To me, intuition would be processing that information in such a way that you are guided towards one decision or another. It's not uh, missing data points. It's not not thinking about them. It's just chunking all that information, putting it together so that you can respond very, very quickly in the same way when you play eight tables online where you are being reactive, right? Mm -hmm, you're you're mm -hmm. just seeing, you're just... Uh, seeing the situation, you're processing it all, chunking information in your head very, very, very quickly and taking actions. And sometimes you can't even explain why you took the action that you took. It just, you know, quote unquote, felt right. Um, that, yeah, you can do that and make money. Um, however, an inexperienced person that's never played poker before that doesn't know where the data points are, does not know how to prioritize anything, uh, that person using their intuition is going to be a disaster and most likely not make money. So it really hinges on you know, what we're defining intuition as, because if you can't chunk information, if you don't have access to any lines, to any sizing, uh, betting patterns, any sizing tells any like preflop formation analysis, well, yeah, you're not working from a foundation of anything. Like how could anybody win poker without considering these things? So very, very, very good. I think this is spot on. Like, uh, would you say that a, a player like Stu Anger, what does your gut feeling tell you? Was he an intuitive player? Would you, would you say he would fall under that category that he was playing on intuition alone? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. I mean, again, there's data that needs to be evaluated sure. and information that needs to be processed. And I would say Stewie from all reports was exceptionally fast at processing information right. and looking at data points and prioritizing different data points. So I would say right. that like, did he operate on intuition for like high level decisions um, in big spots? Probably, but in the way that we've talked about throughout this episode and not in the way of like, I don't know anything about no, this. I, oh no, I know what you mean. You yes. know what I mean, it's like, yeah, he, he basically, he had a very strong poker instinct in my opinion. Um, and probably trusted himself immensely because of his past success and all the other endeavors. And when you trust yourself to be able to process all these data points, analyze them, prioritize them correctly, well, then you're going to make decisions. You're going to make decisions very quickly, and you're probably going to be making better decisions than your opponents, especially if you're playing poker in the 80s. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And part of the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, like if you told me that according to the definition of uh, Uh, subconscious evaluation of unconscious information. Like, for example, we can think of intuition, which is basically your definition, which is an excellent definition, which I really, really like. If somebody told me uh, Stewie Anger, uh, you know, he was uh, playing like that, I would buy it. Meaning, the, you know, he is playing the game. He's never played it before. I can imagine like a really young Stewie, you know, like uh, 10 years old or whatever, seeing what people are reacting to and then start to build his own strategy based on that. And if somebody said, "Hey, this counts as intuition," I would buy it. It's one of the one of the definitions. That's why I'm asking. And, but it all comes down to how we define things, and it goes to show you how difficult it is to actually define things because yeah. what one person perceives as A, the other person may perceive as B and C, and so on. Yeah, and uh, Berkey told a good story about Phil Ivy uh, somewhere. I can't remember where, but basically, he was the only time he had played against Phil Ivy at that point was a tournament, and it was like a, an anti-only tournament. Anti-only mm -hmm. hold'em, I believe. And Ivy showed up late, 
um, to showed up late to the event and looked around the table and was like, what is this? Um, he didn't even realize that it was like an anti only tournament. Right. Uh, okay. So they told him he sat down at his table, um, looked at his cards and then raised to the optimal raise size. Right. So I, <laughs> not knowing what tournament he was going to play in 10 seconds ago, um, having almost no experience playing pure anti no limit hold right. just sat down and intuitively knew the risk versus reward of what bet size right. he should use. Right. That right. to me, um, is it intuitive? Yes, but it's based on a lifetime of knowledge, information, growth, understanding of risk and reward and right. pot size and how uh, all these things sort of relate to one another that Correct. spits out a conclusion that is pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. But that uh, itself could be built on intuition, right? His history, right? You know, like the, uh, sure. you, you say that this intuitive, uh, you know, uh, decision was based on uh, on meticulous thought, but that meticulous thought could be based on intuition, which could be based on intuition, which could be based on intuition, exactly. turtles all the way down. I yeah, mean, depending on how we define things, right? <laughs> which is why there's this, always this question of like, is Doyle actually good at poker or is right. he just biologically constructed to be good at poker, right? Just exactly. in a way of like, oh, my intuition in this field works very well and I can right. trust it. And then you build on top, layer on top of that, layer on exactly. top of that layer. And then, exactly. yeah. So exactly. anyway, anyway, I think that's, that's a, another philosophical question for another time, whether poker players are born or made. Um, that's right. But yeah, uh, we'll close down shop on today's Discussion of intuition. It's a pleasure as always, Duncan. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been great. And we'll see you next week. Absolutely. Take care, everybody.